Welcome to Exploration Dreamland, a quiet read aloud of the writings of explorers of the real world and the worlds of imagination. Drop anchor, relax into your comfortable bunk, and drift off to dreamland with us as we read a lightly edited version of Pioneer Work in Opening the Medical Profession to Women. Autobiographical Sketches by Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, published in 1895. The book will be read in order, so if you would like to begin at the beginning, please start with Season 2, Episode 26. A quick content note. Dr. Blackwell was an abolitionist, and in her years as a teacher, she did spend some time in places where slavery was an accepted practice. This episode will include occasional descriptions of enslaved people. Because she used the most respectful terminology that existed at the time, we have edited some passages to reflect current trends in language. If you prefer to avoid the subject, Please rejoin us at episode 29. If you would like to stay in touch between episodes, you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook at Exploration Dreamland. If you would like to recommend a text, please email us at explorationdreamland, all one word, at gmail.com. You can also find our episodes on YouTube. Please subscribe or follow, and review us wherever you find us. Your actions will help others find us too. Now, take a deep breath in, and as you exhale, relax any tension in your muscles. Close your eyes, snuggle into your sleeping space, and listen to tonight's tale. Chapter 2 Earning Money for Medical Study, 1845 to 1847. The Idea Taking Shape. When I returned from the Kentucky engagement, the family had removed to the pleasant suburb of Walnut Hills, where the well-known Lane Theological Seminary, under the direction of the Beechers and Professor Stowe, was situated. This healthy place, with its intellectual resources, became the home for many years, I found the family sharing a delightful house with the Reverend Mr. and Mrs. Vale, to whom it belonged, who, with their charming daughter and the professor and elder students of the seminary, formed a very intelligent society. It was during the residence of the family on Walnut Hills that the noble-hearted woman, Lucy Stone, became the wife of an elder brother of mine. My brothers were engaged in business, my sisters variously occupied, the family life was full and active, and for a while I keenly enjoyed the return home. But I soon felt the want of a more engrossing pursuit than the study of music, German, and metaphysics, and the ordinary interests that social life presented. It was at this time that the suggestion of studying medicine was first presented to me by a lady friend. This friend finally died of a painful disease, the delicate nature of which made the methods of treatment a constant suffering to her. She once said to me, You are fond of study, have health and leisure. Why not study medicine? If I could have been treated by a lady doctor, my worst sufferings would have been spared me. 
but I at once repudiated the suggestion as an impossible one, saying that I hated everything connected with the body and could not bear the sight of a medical book. This was so true that I had been always foolishly ashamed of any form of illness. When attacked many years before by intermittent fever, I desperately tried to walk off the deadly chill, and when unable to do so, shut myself up alone in a dark room till the stage of fever was over, with a feeling that such subjection to disease was contemptible. As a schoolgirl, I had tried to harden the body by sleeping on the floor at night, and even passing a couple of days without food, with the foolish notion of thus subduing one's physical nature. I had been horrified also during my school days by seeing a bullock's eye, by means of which one of the professors wished to interest his class in the wonderful structure of the eye. Physiology, thus taught, became extremely distasteful to me. My favorite studies were history and metaphysics, and the very thought of dwelling on the physical structure of the body and its various ailments filled me with disgust. So I resolutely tried for weeks to put the idea suggested by my friend away. But it constantly recurred to me. Other circumstances forced upon me the necessity of devoting myself to some absorbing occupation. I became impatient of the disturbing influence exercised by the other sex. I had always been extremely susceptible to this influence. I never remember the time from my first adoration, at seven years old, of a little boy with rosy cheeks and flaxen curls when I had not suffered more or less from the common malady falling in love. But whenever I became sufficiently intimate with any individual to be able to realize what a life association might mean, I shrank from the prospect, disappointed or repelled. I find in my journal of that time the following sentence, written during an acute attack. I felt more determined than ever to become a physician and thus place a strong barrier between me and all ordinary marriage. I must have something to engross my thoughts, some object in life which will fill this vacuum and prevent this sad wearing away of the heart. But the struggle with natural repugnance to the medical line of life was so strong that I hesitated to pass the Rubicon and fought many a severe battle with myself on the subject. At this time, I had not the slightest idea of how to become a physician or of the course of study necessary for this purpose. As the idea seemed to gain force, however, I wrote to and consulted with several physicians known to my family in various parts of the country as to the possibility of a lady becoming a doctor. The answers I received were curiously unanimous. They all replied to the effect that the idea was a good one, but that it was impossible to accomplish it that there was no way of obtaining such an education for a woman, that the education required was long and expensive, that there were innumerable obstacles in the way of such a course, and that, in short, the idea, though a valuable one, was impossible of execution. This verdict, however, no matter from how great an authority, was rather an encouragement than otherwise to a young and active person who needed an absorbing occupation. If an idea, I reasoned, were really a valuable one, there must be some way of realizing it. The idea of winning a doctor's degree gradually assumed the aspect of a great moral struggle, and the moral fight 
possessed immense attraction for me. This moral aspect of the subject was increased by a circumstance which made a very strong impression on me. There was at that time a certain Madame Restel flourishing in New York. This person was a noted abortionist and known all over the country. She was a woman of great ability and defended her course in the public papers. She made a large fortune, drove a fine carriage, had a pew in a fashionable church, and though often arrested, was always bailed out by her patrons. She was known distinctively as a female physician, a term exclusively applied at that time to those women who carried on her occupation. Now, I had always felt a great reverence for maternity, the mighty creative power which more than any other human faculty seemed to bring womanhood nearer the divine. The first serious essay I ever attempted was on the motherhood of the race or spiritual maternity, that great fact of universal love and service which is the formative principle striving to express itself in the lower physical manifestations. That the honorable term female physician should be exclusively applied to those women who carried on this trade seemed to me a horror. Being at that time a reader of Swedenborg, and strongly impressed by his vivid representations of the unseen world, I finally determined to do what I could to redeem the hells, and especially the one form of hell thus forced upon my notice. My journals of those days, 1845, are full of the various difficulties encountered as this determination took root. I find it written, Dr. Muzzy, a well-known Cincinnati doctor, was horrified at the idea of a woman's going to the Parisian schools which he visited some years ago, and he declares that the method of instruction was such that no American or English lady could stay there six weeks. Mrs. Beecher Stowe thought, after conversation with Professor Stowe, that my idea was impracticable, though she confessed, after some talk, that if carried out, it might be highly useful. She also spoke of the strong prejudice which would exist, which I must either crush or be crushed by. I felt a little disappointed at her judgment and the hopelessness of all help from Dr. M. I resolved to write to Dr. Cox, our family physician when we lived in the East, as a last hope for the present. Sunday, May 4 I read my letter to Dr. Cox to Mrs. Vale, who sympathizes strongly with my desire. She stated Dr. Peck's opinion of the impossibility of a lady studying in Paris, but asserts that the most thorough education can be obtained in private. I will not, however, make up my mind too hastily on so important a subject. Wednesday, 14th. I mentioned my plan to Mr. Perkins. He talked it over a little and then said with a bright face, I do wish you would take the matter up if you have the courage, and you have courage, I know. So invigorating was his judgment that I felt at the moment as if I could conquer the world. He offered with real interest to obtain the opinion of the Boston physicians, to talk with Dr. Avery, and lent me a book of Jackson's memoirs which gives much information relative to the French schools. But a little later it is written, I felt cold and gloomy all day, read in Jackson's memoirs, and felt almost disheartened at the immensity of the field before me. I hesitate as if I were about to take the veil, but I am gradually coming up to the resolution. Again it is written, 
I heard an admirable sermon from Mr. Giles, an English minister, on Christian worship. Very logical, full of poetry, some of the sentences so perfect that I held my breath till they were finished. I thought much on my future course and turned for aid to that friend with whom I am beginning to hold true communion. It cannot be my fancy. Jesus Christ must be a living spirit and have the power of communicating with us, for one thought towards him dispels all evil and earnest, continued thought produces peace unspeakable. May 20 Harry brought me home last evening a letter from Dr. Cox. My hand trembled as I took it. It was kind, giving the necessary information, but perfectly non-committal as to advice. I carried the letter over this morning to the lady friend who had promised to help me pecuniarily. I made up my mind fully to undertake the study if she fulfilled her promise, and already I felt separated from the rest of womankind. I trembled and hoped together. But alas for promises and plans, she offered to lend me one hundred dollars, when I am told that I shall want three thousand dollars. I did not express my disappointment, but asked who would be likely to assist further. She did not know, but thought the plan I had suggested of teaching and laying up money for a few years decidedly the best. Thrown thus entirely on my own resources, I finally resolved to accept a teacher's position in a school in North Carolina, where, whilst accumulating money for future use, I could also commence a trial of medical study, for the Reverend John Dixon, who was principal of the school, had previously been a doctor. My old diary of those years, still existent, vividly portrays the anxiety and painful effort with which I left the family circle and ordinary social life and took the first step in my future medical career. I felt that I was severing the usual ties of life and preparing to act against my strongest natural inclinations. But a force stronger than myself then and afterwards seemed to lead me on. A purpose was before me which I must inevitably seek to accomplish. My own family showed the warmest sympathy with my plans. It was before the time of railways. The roads through Kentucky were little traveled. Several rivers had to be forded and three lines of mountains to be crossed. Two of my brothers determined to drive me to my unknown destination amongst the mountains of North Carolina, so the carriage was packed with books and comforts for the eleven days' journey, and on June 16, 1845, with loving goodbyes and some tears, in spite of strong efforts to restrain them, I left home for Asheville, North Carolina, to begin preparation for my unknown career. I find interesting details of that long drive when every day took me farther and farther away from all that I loved. We forded more than one rapid river and climbed several chains of the Alleghenies in crossing through Kentucky and Tennessee into North Carolina. The wonderful view from the gap of Clinch Mountain looking down upon an ocean of mountain ridges spread out endlessly before us and seen in the fresh light of an early morning remains to this day as a wonderful panorama in memory. We at last reached our destination, viz. the school and parsonage of the Reverend John Dixon, formerly a physician, where I was to teach music. The situation of Asheville, entirely surrounded by the Alleghenies, was a beautiful plateau through which the rapid French Broad River ran. 
I must here note down an experience occurring at that time, unique in my life, but which is still as real and vivid to me as when it occurred. I had been kindly welcomed to my strange new home, but the shadow of parting with the last links to my old life was upon me. The time of parting came. My two brothers were to leave on their return journey early on the following morning. Very sadly, at night, we had said farewell. I retired to my bedroom and gazed from the open window long and mournfully at the dim mountain outlines visible in the starlight, mountains which seemed to shut me away hopelessly from all I cared for. Doubt and dread of what might be before me gathered in my mind. I was overwhelmed with sudden terror of what I was undertaking. In an agony of mental despair, I cried out, Oh God, help me, support me, Lord Jesus, guide, enlighten me. My very being went out in this yearning cry for divine help. Suddenly, overwhelmingly, an answer came. A glorious presence, as of brilliant light, flooded my soul. There was nothing visible to the physical sense but a spiritual influence so joyful, gentle, but powerful surrounded me that the despair which had overwhelmed me vanished. All doubt as to the future, all hesitation as to the rightfulness of my purpose, left me, and never in afterlife returned. I knew that, however insignificant my individual effort might be, it was in a right direction, and in accordance with the great providential ordering of the human race's progress. This is the most direct personal communication from the unseen that I have ever consciously had, but to me it is a revealed experience of truth a direct vision of the great reality of spiritual existence, as irresistible as it is incommunicable. During my few months' stay in this friendly household, I borrowed medical books from the doctor's library, for my purpose of becoming a physician was known and approved of. On one occasion, a fellow teacher laughingly came to me with a dead cockchafer which had been smothered between her pocket handkerchiefs and offered it to me as a first subject for dissection. I accepted the offer, placed the insect in a shell, held it with a hairpin, and then tried with my mother-of-pearl-handled penknife to cut it open. But the effort to do this was so repugnant that it was some time before I could compel myself to make the necessary incision, which revealed only a little yellowish dust inside. The battle then fought, however, was a useful one. In my later anatomical studies, I never had so serious a repugnance to contend with. The winter passed pleasantly away in beautiful Asheville. I was in friendly relations with all around me. In my leisure time, I studied in the pleasant grove which connected the school with the church, rejoicing in the ever-changing mountain outline visible through the trees. The harbinger, with its bright visions of associated life, came regularly to me, and nurtured that faith in cooperation as the necessary future of society, which has become one of my articles of faith, my chief regret at this time being the stoppage of my attempt to teach the enslaved children to read, as this was forbidden by the laws of North Carolina. The following letters describe the life in North Carolina. Asheville June 29, 1845 Dear M, 
My first impressions of Asheville are decidedly pleasant. I find the Reverend Mr. D. a well-educated, intelligent man, beloved by all, and regarded quite as a father by all his pupils. He reminds me continually of Mr. L. in the shortness of his legs and the activity of mind and body, in superficiality of thought and obliging social disposition. Mrs. D. is decidedly lovable, quite a little lady, ever cheerful, kind, and intelligent, performing her numerous duties like a small, true Christian. Asheville, 1845 Dear H., I am very glad to find that you have the feelings of a gentleman that, though you would not promise to write to me, you perform, which is decidedly the better of the two. Now I have to call you and S. to account for your breach of promise. What is the reason you did not come to my window, as you agreed to do, the morning you left Asheville? I got up before four o'clock and waited and watched, at last grew angry and wished in revenge that you might have fine weather and plenty of ripe blackberries the whole way. It was a very shabby trick, and if you do not render a satisfactory explanation, I shall scold you well when next we meet. Your domestic items all interest me. How do you like the change of teachers in the school, and who will superintend your room? Will Dr. Ray still teach? You must tell me also what day school begins, that I may think of you and Billy sitting with grave faces behind the little wooden desks, rivaling one another in intense application. Did you take home any stones for our cabinets? Does the collecting fit continue, or has it vanished with the departure of Mr. Hildreth? I have not obtained many specimens as yet. Little Sarah Dixon takes great interest in bringing me what she considers pretty rocks and putting them on a newspaper on my window seat. I was really surprised the other day to see how pretty they looked, though, of course, not of much value. Little bits of quartz, white, gray, brown, pink, a stone full of mica, which looks like a piece of lead ore, a conglomerate of nice quartz, tinged with some metallic substances, and with garnets embedded in some of the stones, and flints of various colors, nothing to a professed mineralogist, but pleasing to me. Last week I went to a party at Mrs. P.'s. She has a separate establishment from the hotel, with which she does not choose to have anything to do. I was invited to meet some Charleston ladies who had called on me and made themselves very agreeable. I suppose you would have been most pleased with the eatables. The ice cream, whips, jelly, and cakes were delicious. But what delighted me was a little Channing glorification, M will understand what I mean, that Mrs. Carr, the lady who so resembles Ellen Channing, and I held in the garden. She has never seen our Mr. Channing, but the doctor used to visit at their house, and she described with enthusiasm a splendid sermon that she heard him deliver in Philadelphia. I replied by describing the eloquence of our Mr. C. Then she expatiated on the kindness and loveliness of the doctor's character, to which I added a description of the goodness, purity, and the angelicalness of his nephew, whereupon she expressed a great desire to see him, and I said that I should consider it one of the greatest of blessings to have enjoyed the social intercourse of the good doctor. The conversation was quite a treat to me. 
a sort of safety valve to heterodox steam that I lacked so deplorably at Henderson. My playing seemed to give satisfaction. The piano is a beautiful one, like ours on a more brilliant scale. And as there was no one to rival me in the instrumental way, I raised the top, played the potpourri, and made a tremendous noise. I do wish that minister would stop singing his nasal hymn tunes just underneath me. He has been at it all day, and it quite puts me out. I also showed some tricks which puzzled the company, particularly a very tall man with long projecting nose and retreating forehead who looked like a stupid fox. Miss Jane P. was seated in a corner behind a little table on which drafts were arranged as the nuns of the Lady Abbess, she challenging everybody to introduce the four cavaliers unknown to the blind mistress. Everybody said it was not possible, and Miss Jane turned triumphantly to me to know if I could do it. I said I could not only introduce the four knights, but their four squires also, and then suffer knights, squires, and four nuns to elope without the blind abbess having the slightest suspicion of the defection. Everybody thought it impossible, but when I actually performed the feat, they looked upon me as half a conjurer, particularly the stranger fox, and Mrs. Dixon thought it was hardly safe that I should occupy the front bedroom in a young lady's boarding school. I also amused them with the three jealous couples crossing the stream. We were all very merry, and I did more talking than I have accomplished in the same space of time for many a day. On our return home, the young gentleman who accompanied me said that if he had only known I was coming, he would have gone from New York to Cincinnati to escort me to Asheville. I did not tell him how very glad I was he did not know it. And on my expressing a wish to visit Mount Pisgah, he assured me that to the very next party that was made up, he would be sure to see that I received an invitation. I did not say he need not trouble himself, that I should get the invitation without his interference. I only thought all that, for I am growing very polite in my manners. About a week ago, I rode to the Sulphur Springs, which are about four miles from Asheville, they are not much resorted to, the country round being tangled and rather uninteresting. The springs, however, are situated in a delightful valley through which the wind blew most refreshingly. A roofed platform is erected in the midst of the grass plat, the perfectly clear water welling up into a marble basin on one side and then flowing away in a little rivulet. I found a countrywoman resting herself on the platform with a bright, pleasant face and very communicative. I sat and talked to her and thought of the woman of Samaria. Presently, a bilious-looking southerner came down and drank a dipper full of water, which dispelled all the illusion for my imagination conjured up rice swamps and clanking chains. I have not taken many walks about here, for the weather, though delightful for July, is too hot for walking, and riding seems out of the question, it being harder to get a horse here even than it was at Henderson. Dr. Dixon has one old fellow, but he is used in the fields a good deal, and one person cannot ride alone. Borrowing or hiring seems equally impossible, so I shall be the poorest rider in the family, apparently, for I suppose Henry's nice little pony and our three other horses 
will be kept in constant use. I find it equally impossible to get a partner in chess. Dr. Dixon understands no such games and disapproves of them, so I cannot train any of the girls, and Miss C. does not care to play. I set up the men one afternoon and tried to beat myself, but it would not do. I could get up no enthusiasm, so I put the pieces away in despair and used the board as a writing desk. Tell me all the home news, what M does, and Ellen, and Kate, what nonsense H talks, and S's puns, the visits they receive, and the excursions they make. If you hear of any new books, let me know, for I imagine they do not find their way up here very quickly. I have Little's Living Age regularly, and I am reading Allison's History of Europe, but such a thing as a novel Dr. Dixon reprobates, and all he calls light reading. Now, Howie, do you not think I am very good to send you such a long letter for your little scrap? Write me a full sheet soon. Asheville July 27, 1845 Dear Mother, I received your welcome letter last night while engaged in your favorite Saturday evening's employment, singing hymns. A stranger minister who was to preach next day had just arrived, and I, seated at the piano, surrounded by the girls, was supplying him with sacred entertainment when Howard Dixon laid your letter beside me. I smiled and gave an involuntary quaver in the Come Holy Spi- which made the girls giggle, but seeing the four eyes of the two ministers bent astonishedly upon us, I pulled a long face, the girls straightened theirs, and we continued, Writ Heavenly Dove, I soon ran off with a candle and my letter, and read with eagerness all the profane parts and most of the religious, as it is a first letter. I am very glad that you derive so much peaceful satisfaction from Upham. I know it has a soothing influence, for whenever I had to go into your room of an afternoon, I found you asleep on the bed with the book in your hand. But I find no lack of such books here. Jonathan Edwards on the affections which I have lately read has the same peaceful tendency. I have just performed my first professional cure and am already dubbed Dr. Blackwell by the household. I mesmerized away a severe headache that afflicted Miss O'Hara, a kind-hearted, childlike, black-haired little old maid, the favorite of the family and a special pet of the children. She had just recovered from a very severe attack of illness and great suffering in the mouth from calomel, which made her declare that no physician ought to receive his diploma till he has been salivated, that he may know the torture he is inflicting on his patients. I went into her room last night and found her suffering from an intense throbbing headache. I offered to relieve her, half doubting my own powers, never having attempted anything of the kind, but in a quarter or half an hour she was entirely relieved and declared some good angel had sent me to her aid. I have just returned from the Sunday school which we have organized today for the enslaved people. When I first came here, I determined to teach all of them that I could to read and write and elevate them in every way in my power, as the only way I could reconcile it to my conscience to live amongst them but to my consternation I found that the laws forbade it, 
and that Dr. Dixon was not willing to evade them. Not the slightest effort was made to instruct them in any way, except that now and then a sermon was preached to them, but they had to labor on without a ray of light or hope. It was intolerable to me, and I proposed at last we should have Sunday school and give them real instruction, and as such a scheme had been talked of about a year ago, I found a few who were willing to engage in the undertaking. Accordingly, this afternoon at three o'clock we made a beginning. Four ladies and one gentleman, with about twenty-five scholars. We have a class of men, women, boys, and two of girls. I take one of the latter, four girls, from eight to twelve years old. I assure you I felt a little odd sitting down to teach them a religion which the enslavers professed to follow whilst violating its very first principles, and audaciously presuming to stand between them and the Almighty. As I looked round the little room and saw those ladies holding forth to the people they enslaved, fancying that now they were fulfilling every duty and were quite model enslavers, I longed to jump up and, taking the chains from those injured, unmanned men, fasten them on their tyrants till they learned in dismal wretchedness the bitterness of that bondage they inflict on their brethren. But one person can do nothing. I sat quietly teaching and reserved my indignation to vent on this inoffensive paper. I am afraid much cannot be done for the enslaved people in this way. Oral instruction is so tedious that the patience of both teachers and scholars may be worn out. I, however, shall do my utmost to illuminate both head and heart and the poor children thanked me with humble sincerity this afternoon for my efforts. You need not be afraid I shall make myself conspicuous or gain the hated name of abolitionist. I sometimes reproach myself for my prudence and the calmness with which I answer some outrageous injustice while I am really raging with indignation but it is the only way in which I can hope to do any good, for the slightest display of feeling arms all their prejudices, and I am no orator to convert by a burst of passionate eloquence, so I must even go on in my quiet manner, knowing that it does not proceed from cowardice. I wish I could give you a cheering account of numerous music scholars and French and German classes, but the place is too small for anything of the sort. I hear constantly a great deal about Charleston. Everybody seems connected with that city, and a great many of the inhabitants are spending the summer here and at the springs. I mean to make some inquiries about the schools and teachers of that city. It would be a pleasant residence in some respects. I mention this not from any serious idea of going there, but that you may know the schemes that are passing through my mind. I am fixed here till December. My brain is as busy as can be and consequently I am happy, for one is only miserable when stupid and lazy, wasting the time and doing no good to self or anybody else. So you too, mother, confirm Henry's account of the fine doings on our quiet walnut hills. I shall really begin to think that I have been the evil genius of the place, withholding the rain from the garden, the visitors from the house, for no sooner am I gone than floods of both flow down and up, and everywhere are greenness and gaiety. Very well, I certainly won't come back to bring a blight into paradise. But, seriously, if Miss A. G. comes up, 
I hope M will consider it a call and return it with dignity, for it seems to me H is growing wild and turning our house into a sort of banqueting hall for Comus and his crew, which I beg M to set her face against by taking every visit to herself. My white bonnet is much admired here. Miss Charlotte Carr sent to borrow it the other day, and has made one its exact image, flowers and all. I felt quite proud in setting the fashion in Asheville. In 1846, the Asheville school was broken up, and I resolved to try my fortunes in the South, journeying with Mrs. John Dixon to Charleston, South Carolina exchanging the fine mountain country for the level rice fields of South Carolina. It was a striking journey, a transformation scene. It is thus described in a journal of that date. On January 14, we left by stage early in the morning. We jolted off in the bright moonlight. The ground was frozen hard and very rough. I walked with Flynn over the Blue Ridge and the Saluda, another branch of the Alleghenies. The weather was beautiful, the air invigorating, and the mountain seemed to deserve its name. On the top of the Saluda, a stone marks the boundary of the two Carolinas. I hesitated at crossing it, for my affections are all with the Old North State. At the foot we drank to its health from the Poinsett Spring, as we had promised John to do. A little afterwards we passed the wildest scenery I ever remember to have seen. The road wound down the south side of the mountain in very abrupt curves, so as to form a succession of terraces one above the other, whilst on the opposite side the wooded mountain ridge though so near, was softened by mist and seemed to tower to tremendous heights, though I was surprised to see how this height seemed to lessen as we descended. We reached Greenville late, after eighty miles of horribly rough staging. There we spent the next day, and I took a pleasant walk with Flynn by the Reedy River, which rushes in cascades through rocks and wooded hills. The next two days we traveled through pretty, undulating country, gradually becoming more level. I saw the first characteristic swamp, also the palmetto and the strange gray moss a yard long, hanging from the trees. We spent a night in Columbia, it seemed a strange revival of old associations to enter a city once more. The hotel was full of horse racers engaged in betting. The next day, a rapid railway journey brought us to Charleston by two o'clock. The country between Columbia and Charleston was much prettier than I expected. The lovely day made everything beautiful. The numerous pines, the holly, wild orange, live oak, and other evergreens seemed to give the lie to January. The moss, hanging one or two yards long from the trees, looked like gigantic webs or the ghosts of weeping willows. The rice fields, under water, were as blue as the sky. The level cotton fields, extending for hundreds of acres, with their belts of evergreens, were strange and beautiful. When we reached Charleston, we were met at the station by Dr. Sam Dixon's carriage, with its very gentlemanly coachman, who had been sent for Flynn and the lady. So I said good-bye to kind Mrs. John Dixon, and, driving softly along to a large old-fashioned house, Surrounded by a garden full of tall evergreens, I entered a spacious hall and was welcomed by Dr. Sam and Mrs. Dixon and their eldest daughter, and ushered into a handsome drawing-room, cloak, hood, smoke, and all. 
Dr. Samuel H. Dixon, who thus hospitably welcomed me, was a distinguished physician of Charleston and professor in the medical college of that town. He gave me kind encouragement in relation to my medical studies. Through his influence, I soon obtained a position as teacher of music in the fashionable boarding school of Mrs. Dupre, a connection of the doctor, where I taught for some hours every day, spending all my spare time in pursuing the medical studies which Dr. Dixon directed. Every morning, a couple of hours were devoted before breakfast to learning the necessary rudiments of Greek for I had only so far been acquainted with Latin. The boarding school occupied a fine old-fashioned mansion. The noble drawing-room, with its numerous windows overlooking the bay, was the scene of my teaching duties. When they were over, many quiet hours were passed in that pleasant room, studying the medical books which the doctor supplied from his library. The severe duties of teaching and study were occasionally varied by larger interests, such as hearing a very able, though erroneous, oration on states' rights by Calhoun, or the more carnal pleasure of a visit to a banana plantation. John C. Calhoun's address given to the enthusiastic meeting which crowded the theater was noteworthy. The contrast between the calm, able orator, who appeared entirely unmoved by the rapturous demonstrations of his audience, who responded to every point in his clever but measured oratory, resembled the effect produced in our later day by the able statesman Parnell, who dominated his ardent Irish followers by a similarly contrasted mental constitution. The influence of this able statesman, John C. Calhoun, was largely instrumental in causing the Civil War in America. The following familiar home letters indicate some of the varieties in the Charleston life. Charleston, January 30, 1847 Now, dear M., for a comfortable Sunday afternoon chat with you after a long, it seems to me a very long, silence. I've just replenished my body with a comfortable portion of our regular Sunday dinner, ham, fowl, sweet potatoes, and macaroni, of which last I've grown particularly fond. And now, wrapped in my blanket shawl, I sit with my feet on the fender, over the embers of the parlor fire. And as the girls are at church, and only good Miss B in the room, I hope for a nice long quiet time. But I must tell you of a great musical treat I've had, really the highest pleasure in that way that I ever remember. No less than two concerts by Herz and Sivory. I never have been so affected by music before, yet the first concert made me sad, homesick, and discontented. I felt as I do after reading a powerful novel of Bulwer's. It was Sivory's violin that produced so strange an effect. Hers was a smooth, brilliant pianoforte player with considerable superficial talent, nothing more. But Sivory has genius. His playing bewildered me. I did not understand it. It seemed to me like a chaos that might become a world of beauty could I only find the word that should reduce it to order. I went home unhappy and indignant at being obliged to pass life in such a stupid place amongst such stupid people where is neither beauty, nor intelligence, nor goodness. The next concert, it went better with me. 
I sat near the platform immediately in front of Sivori and examined his countenance, which certainly renders his performance clearer. He is very small, his head large for his body, a fine forehead, grand eyes, a stiff, sober manner, and occasional half-suppressed smile that reminded me continually of Ellery Channing. The first piece, Il Campanello, of Paganini, was a gem, the solemn, subduing adagio with a wild, striving conclusion, and the little clear silver bell coming in continually, like an angel's voice in the conflict of good and bad spirits. Then his prayer from Moise, performed on one string, was the most devout music I ever listened to. I felt as if I were worshipping in an old cathedral at twilight, and I shut my eyes not to destroy the illusion by the expressionless concert room and faces all round. The duet between hers and Sivori was grand, both parts were so perfect. I went to the concert with a prejudice against hers from knowing his very bad moral character, but his playing is very brilliant, though he is far from being a demeyer. He has the most self-satisfied expression in his mouth, which, as a gentleman remarked, seems to be going to eat his ears, it is so large. He was recalled after one of his pieces, and said, smiling, I will play you a piece which I composed since I am in Charleston. It is called Souvenir de Charleston. Twas quite a dashing affair, and then he extemporized beautifully on Lucy Long. I hope you may have the pleasure in Cincinnati of hearing these real artists, Oh, for the time when such music may be a daily feast for all, and when the performers shall be as noble in character as they are gifted in talent. Stay tuned for the next segment from Pioneer Work in Opening the Medical Profession to Women by Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell. Please follow, rate, and review us on your favorite podcast app. Keep in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube, and recommend us to anyone you know who could use a quiet break or a little help falling asleep. Exploration Dreamland is produced, edited, and hosted by me, Sarah Vansaley. A big thank you to Project Gutenberg for helping me find this and many other interesting publications. Thanks also to Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com for providing the theme music for this show. The title of this piece is Kalimba Relaxation Music, if you would like to visit his website to hear it in its entirety. Sweet dreams.